Here we are, live in person. Woo! That's a beautiful film. It's very cute. That's, you hadn't seen that in a while, correct? Yeah. I remember, I saw it once, but I did not really remember. The only thing I can say, this is not my voice. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at that film, what, what, it, what does it make you think about your life? At, the business is 25 years now. Does, um, what does it evoke? You know, it's very strange to, it still is strange for me that it's 25 years that I started, but I don't know, it seems like a long time and it seems like a short time. I'm talking of these 25 years. But I should say that I have very few, um, I have a li little memory, first of all, but I have very few in my memories. People in general know a lot of dates and the only date apart from my birthday and few birthdays, the only day that I really know is when I started my company, which is the 21st October of 1991. And I remember things if it was before that period or during that period. You told me a story about what it was like to start in that period. Tell me a little bit of what people said about that period when you started. Um, I started so at the, at the end of 91, which was economically a very bad period. It just was the end of the first Gulf War. So the economy was worldwide was through a huge crisis. And uh, so when I decided to start the company with my two best friends and older friends, people were saying, this is really stupid, this is really crazy, and this makes no sense, it's the worst time. And I understand that timing is important, but I really think that the only timing which really matters is your inner timing. So yes, it was a very bad moment to start, but at the same time, I did it, and it proves that I was not completely not right to do it at this moment. So you always have moments where economy, problems, politics are going to be drowning, and then it goes up again. It's always, it's never fluid and it's never even, but you always have going back and forth. So I would say that during bad moments, the bad moments, let's say in economy, are good moments to actually think, to take a bit of time, to realize what you've been doing, what you should do, what you should consider, and it's bad timing is a good moment to actually think properly. Hmm. Bad timing in other people's eyes, but your gut instinct said go for it. Let's say bad period. Yeah. But it seems like your instincts are always driving you. That's, that's, you don't really listen to a lot of other people. You go with what you feel should happen at a specific time. I do listen to people. I do listen to people, but I'm before, uh, well, I have a company. And, but before being a company, it's, it's my passion and it's my work. So I first consider that I have a job that I love, and then after that, it's actually a company. Hmm. But the first thing which is important to me is that I work with my passion for my, for my work. So I don't remember what I was talking about, but... Who well, you listen to, whose what? advice you listen so, to. Um, Oh God, yeah. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that it's important. To, it's important to listen to people and to to be aware of what happens. But definitely, when um, you are you are designing, you really have to have a big trust in yourself. Mm. That's the main thing because your thing, what you are going to do, and what you are going to propose, is basically really you and what you believe in. So if you have no belief in what you do, first of all, it's a, it becomes very complicated. So yes, it's important to listen to people, and, but at the same time, you still have to have, it's important to feel confident. When you came home and said to your mother the first time, I want to be a shoe designer, she said? Nothing, she said, what do you want to eat tonight? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And that's probably about it. And um, she was not really interested. You know, I mean, she, I, was, I was a bit of a, I was, I mean, I was definitely a child, so I was saying many, many things. So if she had to listen <laughs> to everything I was saying, she would, she she would have say, what do you time. want to eat? So, but I say that, but I'm not saying that my mother was not interested in her kids. She was pretty much the opposite, and she was very supportive. But she, um, 
Yeah, she probably say nothing. She probably say, okay, that's another Luby that he's having for the moment. You know, but the we still have to eat tonight. The video would sort of imply that you were older for your years as a child. Is, is that a fair assessment? Mm. Well, uh, I'm sort of used to say that I was mature, very young, and uh, which permits me to be mature very young too. And so when I was 12, 12, 13, I was quite already quite mature and quite of an adult. I sort of knew what I wanted to do, more or less. I was, I was not necessarily interested by school. I couldn't wait so that I could stop at school, meaning being 16 in France. And um, I had another life in a way. I had all the friends, so I had a whole thing around. And um, again, what am I talking about? What were you, what, what? How you, you know, whether you yes, were an so, adult as a child, wait, so your maturity. I was, I was, I was feeling quite mature, and which reminds, which reminds me to not to be afraid. You know, when you're a kid, and you, you're bad at school. People are saying you're bad at school. It's terrible, and you're terrified. Yeah. And I realized very early that school was. Uh, meaning f meaningful for a lot of people was interesting, important for people, for s a lot of people, and other people couldn't care less. And I was making part of that, and I sort of knew that I wanted to do few things in my life, and it was not really depending on school, and uh, but also that if ever I wanted to to learn again, I could do it after. Mm. But I was so quite early. I wanted to leave, and I wanted to work. When I when I was really 18. I thought, really, it's time to, to get a real serious job, because I thought I was very, very old at the time. And uh, so this is why, even when I started the company, uh, so I was 27, I thought, really, that it was very old to start a company when, uh, to be, when you well, were Well, there were a couple steps before. So mm -hmm. what was the most influential moment, career-wise, before you went out on your own? I worked for different people. And um, so that, I would say that my background, my professional background, has, be, has been shattered in two. One which was more industrial, and the other one which was more creative. I've been working for Monsieur Roger Vivier, so mm. Monsieur Roger Vivier, who was alive, so I was not designing for him, but I've been helping him, um, I've been helping him uh, showing his work, also, museology part, you know, archives, etc. Because he was no longer working; he was 80 at the time. And but I looked at his work; I knew his work. He was talking very much of his work, so he's definitely been my mentor on that mm. side. But also, when I was 18, I went. So this is a little fairy tale thing. So Madame de Mortemar, Madame de Mortemar was the direct the director of uh, Christian Dior mm. Couture. So she took me when I was 18. I went to see her. And, um, and then the shoes were fabricated by Charles Jourdan at the time. So she sent me, uh, she sent me to Charles Jourdan where I worked for one year. So this the second part of my work, which was more industrial. This is where I've been learning modelism, all the technicity. Hmm. So I had a bit of a fairy thing with Roger, which was after, and a more technical background with, um, with Charles Jourdan. So I always love to mix the two. I've always been mixing in my company the two sides. Some things you can do in a bigger volume and some things are more dedicated to artisanship, smaller, smaller editions, smaller things. And even I remember the first years I could find things when I was traveling, a piece of fabric, okay? It was only enough to do six pairs. So I would think, I would not think, okay, it's only six pairs, so I won't do it. I was doing four pairs hmm. and the possibility to do two special orders. Why? It's because some things you cannot produce to the infinite, and some you don't. But one is a very good laboratory for the rest. So it's important for me, it's always been important to be able to mix the two things. So travel's been a really important piece of your life. Tell the story of why travel was important to you as a child, because there are a lot of childhood references here. Um, travel has always been important because I was born and raised in Paris and uh, I had a family very, very stable. So we would go, we come from Brittany, so we would go 
uh, from Paris, we go to Brittany every you know, for Easter, for Christmas, and for um, for the summer things, etc. So it was very very stable and always sort of repetitive, which I sort of had no problem. But I realized that if I wanted to travel, see other things, I had sort of to do it myself. Mm. And so, but also when I was going to, uh, I was walking to school, which was close to the apartment where we were living, and there was an agency, a travel agency. So my favorite game actually was to take those big books where you, you go from that place to that place to that place to that place, etc. So I was sort of uh, having, uh, I was having imaginary traveling. Travels. But at the same time, it was a very good training because, first of all, it was a very good training if I, if I wanted to be an accountant, which I never wanted, but because at the time it was French francs, so I would decide to go to India. So India is rupee, so one French franc equals this of rupee, one rupee equals this in French franc. So I was doing all the calculation and I, have, I was having all those papers that I was listening by heart and I was thinking, okay, I'm staying 10 days there, and then learning about the difference, the jet lag, everything. So I really was traveling from my bedroom. I was traveling everywhere. Everywhere. And, uh, and little by little, actually, from my bedroom, I ended up traveling, really. And so discovering a lot of places. And so it's been very important because I've been, since the age of 14, 15, traveling in a lot of countries. And it opens. It opened my mind, it opened my eyes, it opened my ears to, and to see the difference how people are living, but also everything you're not even expecting mm -hmm. from different cultures, civilizations, people, etc., is really a, a mind opener. And that's very important for me. Tell the audience a little bit about opening that first store and, and those circumstances of that, really the beginning of the brand. Um, First of all, I worked 88, 1988 and 1989 with Roger Vivier. Mm. After that, I sort of decided there is really no one that I want to work with, so I stopped. So at the end of 89, I started to do landscape architecture. And for two years, 89, 90 and 91, I was actually doing a landscape architecture, so I've been working. Were you done with shoes, or what had happened there? Yeah, I was sort of done with shoes. I just realized that at the time, I realized that I had worked with someone who really was a fantastic yeah. designer, a fantastic creator, and I didn't see anyone who, in a way, was able to give me, who could compete for me, yeah. in the sense of I was so in love of the work of Roger, so um, I was adoring him. So I just thought there is no way I'm going to work with someone that I'm going to cherish even half of it. So I thought, not necessary. And I thought, okay, this is a thing that I've been doing since I'm a kid. It's maybe a childish thing. And maybe as an adult, you have the right to change. And you have the right to decide that you can change your path and decide for something else. So I thought. Now I don't want to work for other people. I'm done with this. So even if I was missing it, I thought I was done. And so in 91, I was buying, I always loved to buy objects, furniture. So I was trying to buy a piece of furniture in this gallery in Paris called Galerie Verododa. And the, the antique dealer would not sell that bloody piece, which I have now. <laughs> and uh, I got him. Made that happen. I got him. And um, so he would not sell it, so I would go back and forth and back and back and forth trying to get a body piece, which is a lamp of André Arbus, two cones on the hand. And um, at one point, he was so fed up, he says, what about your shoes? I say, I stopped. He said, why? I said, I don't want to work for anybody. Mm. He said, so why don't you do your thing yourself? So there is a place that he would have done anything to really push me out of his store. So he said, go there, at the end, there is, at the end of the gallery, there is a place, why don't you take it and do your own shoes? So I thought, well, I didn't really think about, the, the reality is that I'd never thought about it. And then suddenly, it sort of clicked, I thought, yeah, that's not completely a stupid idea. And uh, I discussed about that with my two best friends at the time, Henri and Bruno, and uh, Henri says, yes, why don't you do it? 
let's do something together. We built a company, you design the shoes, you have thousands of drawings, get a factory, I mean, m move your ass, he said, basically. <laughs> he said, find somewhere where we can do the fabrication of the shoes, and that's it. So I had a second thought. I thought, yes, it's true. I have a lot of design. I have not realized all this design, and I have tons, tons of it, and I've been thinking of it, and I'm quite impatient. So landscape architecture was very nice, but you have to be patient. So I realized that probably everything which is around fashion, you need that impatience. Mm. Because Those gardens things, take a long time to Yes, grow. and in the fashion industry, things are going quicker. Yep. So you sort of need to be impatient. Being too patient is not a quality in the fashion industry. So I thought, OK, let's do that. And so we took that store, and we actually started the company. But it was funny, because I had designed for a lot of people, but I never had been. Um, neither a good assistant, and I never stayed more than a year in any of the companies. And I realized after, because I was, I was sort of sad that people were firing me all the time. I was fired from schools, and after, after every time I was trying to work for a company, they were firing me. I said, what's well, what were problem they, is what coming were they from fired? me? It has to come from me. What were you fired for? I don't know. Well, for school, yes, I was doing nothing. I was really bad. <laughs> I was arriving with the... <laughs> That was very normal. But uh, from company, I really didn't know. And I realized sort of after that I was a terrible assistant because mm. I wanted to do everything. And I just, I just, you know, I was so enthusiastic that I wanted to do everything. And they couldn't put me to bed. You know, I was like early in the morning. I was never leaving. And I was always there. And this is not a thing that you're asking to an assistant. You know, you just it's want too to. Much. You want to be helped. You yeah. don't want to have someone, <laughs> you know, all the time na nagging and nagging and super <laughs> excited. So I realized that, it's, you know, I, it's just in my nature there was something I had to do things myself. So yeah. in fact, yes, I realized that after. So this store happens. The store happened, but I had never worked, as I was saying, more than a year for people. So I didn't know much of the industry, to not to say anything of the industry. I didn't know anything. I knew how to do shoes. I knew how to d design them. But after that, I didn't know that you had buyers. You know, I thought, I live in Paris. I have a shop in Paris. And it's very nice. And that's it. Maybe one day, I was going in London as a teenager. So I thought maybe one day, I had another store in London. That would be nice. Like this, I can go to London. And that was about it. So I was not thinking more than that. And, uh, but what happened is that uh, a magazine, American magazine, W. We know uh, W. W magazine came because they were doing, they were doing um, a feature on new shops in Paris. And so there was this girl and, uh, called Heidi Lander, I remember. Heidi Lander, and she came in the store to do a, a little paper on new shops. So I had to, so she had to come to the store, etc. And the day she came, there was, um, there was a very high profile character in France, Princess Caroline of Monaco, and she came because she was going to a store nearby in the gallery, this antique dealer. And um, so she, the first, so as it's a gallery, the car was stopping, and then I was the first shop. So she actually came the first time because she was going to the antique dealer. But she stopped, she looked at the window, she liked what she saw in the window, she entered, and she bought some shoes. So then she became one of my first customers. While the reporter was doing the story? And she had come before. So she had come before, so she used to come. She had been coming three or four times. So while the reporter was there, she came. And she came with a good friend of her, and she's, she likes to, to play the um, salesman, and she's a good salesman. So she was like, and this I have, and this I have, and this you should take, and this one uh. is very nice, you have it in two colors. Basically, she was selling <laughs> instead. She made the story. <laughs> she made, she, yeah. And so the, um, the Heidi Lander was very surprised to see someone, such a big high profile, in a store that nobody knew, because yeah. I opened so early November, and that was probably in January or something. And so she wrote a piece, and the piece went on W, and because of that, American buyers came yep. the first season. 
But as I didn't know that you had to show a collection ahead, they came and they said, so where is the uh, next collection? I said, what do you mean next collection? <laughs> I said, well, you know, next we come to buy the winter collection. I said, I have a little bit of the summer, because it was March, so I already started. <laughs> I said, but that's, they said, we don't want a summer. We're here to, to buy the winter collection. So I said, I have none. And then, but one who was smart, thank God, I mean, they were all nice and smart, but one was smart to immediately realize that I was really slightly retarded. <laughs> and uh, so she was called Judith Guillard from Barneys, mm -hmm. and she says, okay, we can buy the, this winter collection that you have in your store. I said, but this is the old one. She said, this is old for you, but nobody knows you. It's going to be new for everybody else. Good point. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it's not fair. And then, thank God, I had Henry, my partner, who said, shut up. <laughs> in French, she was not speaking French. He said, shut up. You have the patterns. It's easy to reproduce. Shut up. Sell that. Which we did. And uh, so it's basically called a reorder, in fact, I realized after. And um, so we really started. Um, completely with, we didn't know anything. I mean, Henri is a geek. He didn't know anything about shoes. He could, you know, he could open a fax, that was about it. Me, <laughs> I knew how to sell a little bit, and I knew how to design shoes, but, uh, but you know, we sort of went quick to understand how, how it works. And so the first collection that I sold abroad was my third collection in a row. So, Winter 92, 93 was already existing in 91 in my first store. So I had those six months to understand exactly how it was working, size 10 and 11 for, for models, a head, ta, ta, ta. And, um, and that's it. This but from that point, you've said that you really do listen to retailers. Like they, they are the voice that you respect. Yeah, yes. It's, First of all, you know, I own a lot to retailers. And first reason, it's someone from Barney's who came and said, nobody knows you, and this is going to be new for, for the rest. It's fine. This is a retailer saying that. Yeah. And, but also, I really, for instance, I remember very well, I did the first pair of shoes, which was quite successful from the first collection, was a flat pair of shoes, and you were joining the two feet, and it was written love. So you only had the design complete when you had the, the, the pair touching each other. Inspired by? Inspired by an image that I had seen of someone looking very, very sad, looking at her feet with her husband sitting on another chair. And she, she looked very bored and, and sad, um, Lady Diana. And she was looking at her feet. And she has this very you know, royal posture, knees very joint, feet very joint. And, looking like this, very sad. So I thought I should do a shoe where if she was looking at her feet, she would have a smile. She would have the message. Face. Exactly. And uh, so that pair of shoes was the most popular. So I did it in two colors, and it was 48 pairs all together, 24 and 24. And so they got sold quite quickly. And I realized that you could do what was called a reorder. I said, maybe I can add, I can ask to the factory to do. I mean, this is how much I was bad on the business, you know. <laughs> and, um, but you learn. You just have to be aware and learning. So understanding reorders, understanding that, you know, things, if you show things in another country, it is new. A lot of things have been coming from retailers. And again, I remember when... New York, Barney's had one store uptown uh, in New York. They opened in, uh, in California. Mm. And they were explaining me, for instance, that there is a big part of the shipment. In February, everything which is very evening goes to California, especially Los Angeles, because of the Oscar period. So they sell more. So I understand also rotation of stock. So it's really by listening to what buyers have been telling me that I've been actually uh, progressing in my work. And how fast did it go from that point to what we know now? How was it a ro did it feel like a rocket ride? No, no. I don't think there's been a, a break 
or like a very specific moment where things have been changing for me. The only thing which I definitely remember, first of all, I have Bruno, who is, we are still the same partners, and I have Bruno, who is really like the father figure and taking care, he's a CFO and the president, I think. And um, so Bruno would always hide me things, like we had a problem, I would not know. I was there to design, so I was not there to understand that you had problem, we didn't sell enough, whatever, you had a tax problem, whatever. I never was aware about that. He was always very protecting. And, um, but he was there. He always was there to look at this, this aspect of the business. So if I say that it's in 2001, 9-11 happened, and this has been really the change. Yeah. And because in the whole world, it has changed a lot of things. Yep. But let's say that also on a strict retail and business point of view. Yep. Every small company which was not structured in France and in Italy collapsed. Mm. Because everything which was going to be shipped in America in September was cancelled. So if you are not having shoulders a little bit enough, big enough, yep. boom, you know. Nobody really cared, sorry. There is a big problem, 9-11, which is definitely a reality. So there is nothing could be said. So most, I know many, many people who collapsed at that time. Thank God we were just organized. Hmm. So I should just say that the really a moment where I realized that we started to be a company and to be organized, and that uh, also that I had someone watching after what was happening hmm. is because of 9-11. So this is... Uh, nine years after. When did you feel like you were famous? I mean, famous in the sense that people knew the brand and knew who you were. When I was sometimes smuggling shoes from one country <laughs> to another. Um, Yourself? Yeah. Huh? You know, crocodile, for instance, mm -hmm. things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember I remember being in, uh, in California, and I had a bag, a Christian Louboutin bag, and I remember that, so it was, I was carrying it with me, and I was stopped many times because of that bag, and when I arrived in the, when you, you know, when you put the bag like on the x-ray, the, one of the women who was looking at the thing on the radio said, I want to see the shoes, I want to see the shoes, and I was like, you know, I have a plane, you know, if you don't mind. And she was like, no, I want to see the shoes, oh, they look good, ah, you're Mr. Louboutin, so then suddenly, so it's actually through customs. <laughs> customs taught you everything. Could you do it again? Could you start over again in this climate? Yeah, of yeah. course, of course. I think, again, you know, the timing, if you wait for the very correct timing, it never happens. There is always a problem. There is always a problem somewhere. So the only timing which really matters is really your inner timing. Mm. And, but also, it's a very exciting thing to start something. And I started to, uh, I started beauty three years ago. And I really, uh, I put it together for two years before. But really, I really started, let's say, three years ago, it was there when we really started. And it was a beginning again. You know? mm. It was a beginning. It's a different industry. It was a beginning. And the enthusiasm, the excitement of, start, of starting something and really from scratch was the same thing. And, and I love that feeling. But you, you strike me as someone who has no fear, and you told me a story of why when you were a kid. So let's bring it back to your, your, your childhood. Which, which story? And what was stories. next to the apartment, or what was close to the apartment? Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, next to the apartment where we are living, it's in the 12 arrondissement in Paris, so there was a place, it's a, how do you say, Park, in Foire du Trône. An amusement park. Amusement park, yep. so you know what, um, Roller yep. coast and banging cars, etc. And um, I remember, as it was very, very next to the apartment, I would go all the time, and I was doing myself, making sure I would keep my hands out, you know, and then you know, rolling and never putting the two hands. So fear was never an issue for me. And I, when something was a bit, um, come on, was scary. I sort of liked it, and I wanted to actually fight against fear. And I think that fear brings just really, really a bad energy. And yes, it's normal to be 
to have some fear, but it's, it's always good to fight against to those get fears. through it. Yeah. Well, you got through this. You had no fear. We're going to turn it over oh. to the audience for a couple of questions. <laughs> fast. Fast. I can't see. Hello. I got you. Hello. We met in LA. It's me Christian again. did wrote the story. Nice to see you. The story. Hello. I'm, the photo I can't see anything from here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, since celebrity is such a big part of your business, do you look to the red carpet and sort of get inspired by any of celebrity's style? Um, no, not really. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I think that, for instance, to me, um, celebrity as a solid block means not much. And, <laughs> and I'm impressed by people who are doing things. And if they become famous out of the, what they do, it's a very nice thing. But celebrity for celebrity is really not impressive to me. Pretty much on the opposite. I find it sad. And uh, yeah, I find it sad. So no, celebrity is not a big thing for me. I understand the importance of celebrity. I understand the thrill of fame for some people. But really, it's not a thing that um, when I see a movie and when I see a performance of someone in the movie, this brings me something. But when I see a red carpet, it's only a red carpet. You know, what is the performance of a red carpet? And, uh, and again, uh, I, if I have to give five images of people who I would consider incredibly well-dressed or incredibly stylish, I'm not going to find in those five images someone on the red carpet. You know, I don't think that the red carpet is really a, a, a great exposure of someone. You know, it's, uh, Someone crying in a movie is emotionally bringing you, bringing you something. And this is, inspi this is inspiring to me. That's going to be, for me, it's going to be possible to take my pen and to draw a sketch thinking of that situation. Looking at someone on the red carpet doing this, that, and that, it's funny, but it's always the same thing. You know, there is no difference. So even if I respect, I consider, a lot of those people, it's not an inspiring moment, no? The performance Never. is, the artist is. There is no performance. No, but when the, the, if the same person was in a film doing a great performance. Exactly. Yeah. Understood. We have a question here. Sorry. I... Merci beaucoup. Hmm? Uh, what is the most important lesson that you ever learned? The, I didn't hear, sorry. What is the most important Question. I'm sorry, mo the most important lesson. Lesson. The lesson, yeah. The most important lesson that I learned? Um, the most important lesson that I learned? My God, it has to come because I don't <laughs> know <it> yet. <laughs> um, probably. To, um, now it's difficult to me to say this is the most important lesson that I learned. And, um, but the most important, one of the most important thing is th uh, coming from my mother. It's, uh, she always told me, if you don't want to be judged, do not judge people. Hmm. Because I was sometimes criticizing people. And she was saying, you think it's funny, but it's just funny a little bit, but don't go too much in that direction. Because the day you're going to be criticized, you're not going to be happy. But I, you won't be able to complain if you criticize. Don't criticize. If you don't want to be judged, don't judge people. But also, it was a lesson of tolerance, where she was very strong on. Yes. So uh, the biggest lesson is that humility is really a quality. And pretentious has no, has no limit. And and it's not a quality. It's, uh, 
And I see many people saying, um, when they meet fashion people, they always say, but you're normal, you're natural. How come? And it's funny how much the perception of fashion designers is actually bad when you are out of this industry. And it's really often considered, we are often considered as super pretentious and, um, and super vain. And, mm. and it's sad because a lot of people are not like that. But it's true that if you keep a sort of, if you are a bit grounded and with a bit of humility, everything is better. Let's take one more. Um, if you could go back to, uh, if you could talk to young Christian after opening that first store, what's the biggest advice you would give him now where you are? I would say uh, to a person who would start. No, to, to yourself. Ah. What would I say to myself? Um, at the very beginning, uh, at the very beginning, I had this obsession being French, and you know, sort of nationalist French. I wanted really to do the fabrication in France, so I first started with a French fabrication in the south of France, and um, and I mean, I had lost a little bit of hair already. But what was left was gone after a year working in a factory. <laughs> I could have killed myself. So probably I would say to the young me, don't try to work in France in a factory. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have a heart attack. And um, yes, probably I would say, go straight to Italy. They're easy. Go straight to Italy. <laughs> Forget about the French <laughs> Paris. And, and with that, we reluctantly end, but thank you so much. You were thank really you. Awesome.